And thanks again for the intro. Um, so my name is Joe, um, and uh, kind of today I want to talk about how not to shoot yourself in the foot um, when writing Yara patterns uh, in kind of uh, more performance-oriented uh, situations. So. so as mentioned, um, my background is I'm primarily a software engineer. Uh, but uh, I end up doing more than my fair share of security research. I've spent my entire career working adjacent to security researchers and doing security research in addition to software engineering. So focusing on kind of building tools and technologies to help security researchers actually detect and remediate um, threats across a variety of environments and means of detection. So the last four years I've been working with IDS and NSM tools, so Suricata, Zeek, um, and kind of adding functionality to improve our ability to detect uh, threats on the network. Before that, I spent 10 years working on various forms of uh, virus detection and removal at Microsoft. Um, so rootkit analysis and detection, uh, automated uh, signature classification, and cloud-based protection were some of the things I've worked on there. So as mentioned, kind of what I want to talk about today are essentially uh, how to write patterns for Yara if you're going to be using it in a more performance intensive uh, environment. So I'm going to start off talking a bit about kind of some of the other security tools that also do pattern matching against malicious content and kind of some of the differences in use cases and performance requirements for them and kind of then that'll lead into some of the motivations for why would we want to actually start focusing on these improvements in Yara? And where does it make sense to kind of put this level of focus into writing patterns and thinking through them instead of just kind of just getting your job done, but actually having to spend a little more time to get things tuned. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about kind of under the hood how Yara is matching patterns, because that's going to help us to explain essentially why we're doing what we're doing instead of in the past, what I've seen is there's a lot of just do this without really a motivation of why this makes for a better pattern or makes Yara run faster when you do a certain thing. So it'll be some of the basic kind of underlying basics of that. Then I'll get into some of the actual things to improve um, and possibly talk about some things outside of pattern matching that you can also do for uh, improving performance. So... There's a couple of different security tools that we see day to day that are all doing essentially again pattern matching against files or network traffic. So we've seen Yara, it's typically run out of band uh, after the fact. So either you get a file, a memory dump, a PCAP, uh, you upload rules to VT for retro hunt. So when new files come into Virus Total, they're analyzed. You look at quarantined mail attachments. Um, so there's a variety of sources these files come in from. Um, because this is the way Yara is typically run, the way it operates is it loads the full file and it runs all the patterns against all of the data. So anything in that string section is going to get run against everything in every file or memory dump or PCAP you feed to it. Um, the plus side of Yara is it's significantly easier to write um, signatures that give you a lot of value very quickly out of the box. Antivirus has a lot of capabilities, but the signatures are very complex to write and people spend years learning how to write them. Uh, IDS and IPS rules are a bit more accessible, but are still kind of esoteric and require a lot of underlying knowledge of what you're doing. So kind of by comparison to Yara and how it's used, antivirus is running in real time, in the kernel, blocking things. So when a user goes to run a program, um, typically, from a usability standpoint, you want to have figured out yes or no on that file within about 500 milliseconds. If it takes longer than that, um, you're bogging down the system. If something's loading 50 DLLs and you're taking that full 500 milliseconds on every DLL that comes up, all of a sudden now it takes you 30 seconds to open Slack and you don't know why and it's your antivirus. So there's a very strong performance kind of concern there that you wouldn't necessarily have. Um, antivirus has a lot more capabilities as well in terms of they typically have emulation engines, different varieties of pattern matchers, built-in static unpacking, behavioral analysis, and now these days even the ability to go back and talk to a cloud backend with some of the metadata they found and see if there's anything new and fresher than the signature set they're currently running. Um, the other thing with antivirus is 
when it finds something bad, it typically does something about it. It either quarantines or completely removes. If it finds something in memory, it shuts that process down. So the signatures, if there is an FP, something bad is happening on that box. That file is going away. And then finally, there's IDS and IPS. So think uh, Suricata or Snort. Um, these are running against network traffic, either in real time for IPS because they can block or near real time for IPS because, or IDS because they're running out of band. Um, they're looking at most of the data, whereas antivirus is typically trying to minimize the amount of data it can look at um, and to make a determination from a performance standpoint. Um, IDS is looking at almost all of the data other than a few provisions for kind of shunting after a certain point. Um, I, but on the other hand, it does still have the ability to limit patterns to specific protocols, networks, or ports so that you're not necessarily running your whole signature set against every file the way you would in Yara. Um, and then finally, some of the newer IDS and NSM uh, capabilities are around file extraction. So now you have these new artifacts that these um, products aren't actually that well equipped to, uh, to do additional analysis on. Finally, as for EDR, next gen AV, the, it's a very generic term. Um, some of them look like AV engines, others look a lot more like Yara. It's there, there's no one categorization for them. So I'm just gonna kind of gloss over them. So now why do we care about Yara performance? Um, there's a few different uh, use cases that we can't just focus on kind of finding the thing that is the most recent thing to our environment. So one example is Virus Total's new live hunt, which, um, or if you're building an in-house equivalent. So this is kind of as files come in streaming, you're running yard rules against these files in essentially near real time. And Google, if any of the performance warnings get go off uh, when Yara compiles your rule, we'll kick your rule out and yell at you. So even virus total running on Google's infrastructure has limits on kind of how much performance uh, they need out of these rules. Um, other ones are, again, if you've got a new rule and you want to run against a large corpus and you're tuning it and you're tweaking it, having it only take 30 seconds instead of two minutes each time you change it, uh, that starts to add up uh, if you're doing a lot of signature development. Likewise, if you're doing a lot of... Uh, if you're doing a lot of rule development and you've got a limited hardware budget you're running on, which is sadly too true for a lot of us. A lot of times we're, we get the hand-me-down server. We don't necessarily get to go budget out some giant machine with a rack of SSDs. We've got kind of what we got. So being able to essentially do more with less is really valuable. Um, and then kind of the more interesting stuff and the stuff I think is much more compelling is kind of some of the new use cases we're starting to see with Yara. We are moving to near real time and real time. So Clam AV and a couple others support actually loading in Yara rules. So you get now real time blocking, you get some static and dynamic unpacking and memory scanning against anything that's simulated. This is, this is kind of, I saw there were questions earlier as to kind of how do you deal with packed samples? And one of the ways you can do that is you can run your Yara from inside an AV engine. And it'll handle all of that heavy lifting. You won't have to write your own tools. And then you can write your YAR samples as normal, or YAR rules as normal. Um, the one problem with that is an AV engine is a lot of attack surface. So ton of parsers, ton of, it's got emulation. Um, it's just doing a lot more stuff than just straight Yara. So there's a lot more chance that there might be an exploit somewhere in the AV engine. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, one other one, uh, if you want kind of a more limited real-time scanning, uh, there's something that GoDaddy put out a few years ago and that they still maintain called Proc Filter. It's a very lightweight kernel filter that uses Yara rules. So again, it's running in real time. It's capable of blocking, quarantining, or just logging files. Um, it's mostly meant for um, running a limited rule set kind of geared toward attacks specifically targeting an environment and only certain specific uh, servers that are being targeted. It's not necessarily something you'd want to roll out to every endpoint in your environment, but you might. Um, and again, it's the performance of these uh, rules is significantly more important when you're running in kernel in real time. And finally, as I mentioned before, IDS and NSM are starting to extract files, but they don't really know what to do with them. And you can just ship these off for later analysis and come back and look at them in a couple hours or days and just do some periodic scanning. But a lot of people are starting to try and 
move to actually doing the analysis as close to real time as they can. So pretty much as soon as the files carve, they want to go run Yara against it or run some other static tools against it and possibly run that even on the same sensor that's running Suricata or Zeek. And to do that, you need to uh, actually be running relatively quickly because these machines are already running pretty hot as is and this much more IO and um, CPU usage uh, is going to add overhead on those machines. So how does Yara match patterns? Well, um, as you can see here, it starts with atoms, which I'll describe in a minute. And then it runs patterns, which are what live under the strings header. And then it runs the conditions. And then it runs other conditions after short circuit operators, which I'll describe as well for those who haven't heard of them. So atoms are the kind of core part of how Yara initially decides uh, essentially what rules are going to run. So Atoms are substrings of a pattern with a maximum length defined at compile time. The default value is four bytes, uh, and that seems to be a pretty good balance for most use cases. For each of the patterns you have under strings, be it a string, um, a, hex, a hex string, or a regex, Yara tries to find one or more atoms within that pattern to essentially kind of anchor detection. So when Yara does its initial scan of the whole file, it's actually looking just for the atoms. It's not looking, it's not doing all the full patterns right away. And then in order to get a good set of atoms for each pattern, Yara has an internal scoring system that it's using to try and pick the most unique atoms. So it's minimizing the number of matches. And the reason why it wants to minimize the number of matches of an atom is kind of the more matches it has, the more work it has to do. So once the, so, to do the initial matching with the atoms, it's using Aho Korsik uh, matching, which um, is linear in the size of the search string, which makes sense. It's linear in the total length of strings to search for, which is your list of atoms. And then it's linear in the number of matched strings. So if you've got an atom of four zeros and it matches basically every like half of the whole file, um, that's going to cause a big performance hit. And then an even bigger performance hit when that in turn goes and sets off the secondary pattern matching for the rest of each of those patterns. So you're doing a whole ton of work um, if an atom matches in a lot of places. Um, so the more you can limit those full pattern scans and the more you can just limit matches of atoms um, only to files that are the most interesting, the faster you're going to run. Um, so after Yara runs all of these uh, um, patterns, first with the atoms and then the pattern matching, it'll uh, start applying the conditions um, if the pattern matched. Uh, and conditions are as simple as matching for one string or complicated logic with Boolean operators, loops, functions from imported modules. Um, the last talk you saw kind of some of the byte code that's underlying this. Uh, the other thing conditions can do is they can do limited matching of content at fixed offsets within a file. So there's read uint 16, uint 32. Um, these are actually frequently useful for limiting kind of files that have a magic two or four byte intro, like PE files, RTFs. Um, you can do that in conditions rather than in strings. And that means you don't have that atom floating around matching nearly every file and setting off other pattern matching potentially. Um, and as mentioned, Unlike atoms, not all conditions are executed if a previous statement um, short circuits the result. So short circuiting basically means if you have multiple like A, then B, then C, um, or A and B, A and C, um, if A is true um, but B is false, C will never get executed one way or the other, which means you're running less and therefore your performance is going to be better. So let's talk about patterns and some of kind of the things that can get you in trouble in Yara. So the first one and the one that's going to cause you the most problem from a performance standpoint in Yara is regex. Regex is just expensive. Um, there's no easy way around it. Um, you can do some things to improve regex. Regex does do atom extraction. So if you're doing regex, um, you can be careful, can make sure it's got some good atoms. Um, within there to anchor on so that it won't always be firing and bring up the regex engine and chunk churning through a lot of CPU, but it's, it's tough. Um, the other thing um, is using very common atoms. So as I mentioned, four zeros or four Fs is going to appear a lot in a file. It's going to cause a lot of matches and 
these are bad enough, the Yara compiler will immediately yell at you if any of your rules cause one of these. Um, another one that's a little less obvious are um, common atoms that don't necessarily get caught by the YAR compiler, but are still very common depending on what kind of a set of files you're operating against. So for example, the one I show here is actually the 32-bit um, preamble for literally every function exported by a Win32 DLL on Windows. Um, this was essentially to allow for hot patching back in the day. And so literally ex every export function will match this um, five-byte hex string. And then finally, any string shorter than four characters is going to have a chance of matching more often, especially in encrypted or compressed data. So as for the string modifiers, kind of what effects do each of these have? Full word um, doesn't really have any performance impact and tends to lend to slightly tighter signatures because it's essentially effectively checking for uh, a, a non-character uh, um, byte on either side of the word. So it's trivial and kind of gives you exactly what you're looking for. Base64 is going to generate three atoms for the base string and do three compares instead of one. So that's not too bad, um, especially if that's what you're looking for. This is a really easy way to do it. Um, and it's a little more convenient than having to manually generate the three strings, which is the same performance anyway. Um, wide um, has one weird side effect, which is remove is it's essentially reducing the effective value of your max atom length by half. So for four byte atoms, you're only actually getting a, effectively a two byte atom. And there's only 64K possibilities. So if you're operating on a lot of wide character uh, files, what you're going to find is you're going to start saturating like the maximum available atoms pretty quickly and a lot, you're going to essentially be hitting almost every one of those atoms in a lot of your files. And I'll talk a little bit about things you might be able to do about it if that's something you're dealing with. Uh, finally, there's no case, which is very useful, but the thing to keep in mind is no case is going to uh, basically two to the power of your atom length uh, number of atoms for each string minimum because essentially now it has to create each possible casing variant. And again, this is only for ASCII. If there was ever Unicode support, um, casing becomes a, a whole different problem. So now, as I mentioned with wide, um, it can, if you're doing a lot of wide kind of uh, rules and you're running against a lot of uh, essentially a wide character uh, um, files or other uh, or memory dumps, um, you could recompile with uh, a value of eight for your max atom length. And this is going to be um, give you much better performance on wide uh, strings. But it also means if you ever need to use no case, now it's going to be 256 atoms for each no case rule instead of just 16. Um, the other one is this might incur performance penalties on a 32-bit processor because it won't necessarily have the 64-bit compare ready to go, especially for ARM processors. Um, XOR is another interesting one. XOR by design is generating 256 atoms for every uh, string it's applied to. Um, if you're actually looking at a bunch of kind of XOR obfuscated uh, things, then uh, you're going to want to use it. Um, there's just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, the main one is it can inadvertently result in bad atoms. So it's not just when you use XOR, it's not just the string you put in there. It's also every other possible uh, XOR of that. So as one example, let's say you were looking for an XOR encrypted M MBR or master boot record. You can look for invalid partition table, and you can look for uh, essentially the uh, signature that's at the end of the boot master boot record and say, if I see both of these XOR, um, then I want to um, flag this and go look at it. Um, the problem is that master boot record signature uh, can turn into 00FF and FF00, both of which will hit a lot more than the underlying pattern. Um, they fixed this, and it came out a couple days ago in 402, so they actually do check to make sure that you're not getting bad atoms out of an XOR by accident. So that brings us to kind of some of the more useful things, which are wildcards and jumps. Um, these work with hex strings, and they let you do some of the stuff you can do with regex, but without 
um, taking the performance penalty of starting up the regex engine. Uh, Wildcards work at nibbles up, so up to four bit wide, and then bytes, and then so on. And that's what the question marks are. Uh, and and uh, tend to be quite uh, efficient. The one thing that you're going to run into with wildcards is they split apart patterns for what's eligible to be an atom. So an atom cannot contain a wildcard. So if you look at the sample here, obviously, the best atom you're going to get out of that is 4D or 00. zero. And that's going to be bad. Um, the other thing is uh, that uh, tip with longer uh, patterns with a wild card, you might get more than one atom coming out of it on either side of where the wild cards are. If there's two atoms of at least four bytes, um, and that'll be kind of the atom selection algorithm. We'll decide on that. Um, jumps are basically variable length wild cards. Um, you can't do nibbles anymore. You have to do at least a byte. Um, but they're kind of like a, essentially a sliding wild card. So for example, if you're dealing with something where the you're looking for a executable file with both a standard uh, DOS header and then an NT header, but they're doing something funny and they're moving the NT header around a little bit uh, instead of leaving it at the default location, then you might use a pattern like this one to go look for both uh, the MZ and PE header um, in the beginning of the file. And so this is going to generate effectively, again, two atoms, one for 45A, one for 5045 on either side of that. Um, and it's going to, if it sees either one of those, it's going to go do the search in the appropriate direction for the rest of it. Uh, the other thing is when it matches, it actually has to do a comparison for each uh, kind of uh, possible length of that wildcard. So in this case, it'll have to do 257 potential comparisons each time it hits one of the atoms it's looking at. So if you do a longer jump, it can be very expensive, especially if the atoms are weak. In this case, two-byte atoms are going to be problematic. Um, the other thing is for jumps longer than 200 bytes, like the one above, as I mentioned, um, there will be an atom on either side of the jump so that it can essentially search from either side and be more efficient. Um, if the jump is only 200 bytes or smaller, then it's going to use the atom from the beginning of the jump and then just do the comparison straight from there. Um, now, if you really do need to do regex, um, there's a couple things you can do, but you're better off starting with wildcard or jump first. Um, if you can't make it do it, if you really need regex, um, one of the things you can do is um, if you have to have essentially the equivalent of wildcards and jumps, you can do the same thing you can with a jump of you can limit the number of characters in that class um, that can match. In this case, I did it like a wildcard, but as you can see here, it's only going to check for zero to a thousand uh, additional characters in the message it's looking for. Um, and then again, if you can, like if you know the message is only going to be alphanumeric, limit the character class as well. Um, and these two things will help make the regex run a lot faster, but it's still not going to be nearly as fast as wildcard or, or jump. Um, so when you're doing this, uh, the thing to keep in mind, and I'm getting a little short on time, uh, is you can debug this, uh, just run with dash ss, and it'll start outputting statistics for kind of the number of atoms it's selecting. And also, um, how many matches uh, you're actually getting uh, when you run this against one or more files. And the number of AC matches is essentially your number of atom matches. So if you're getting a ton of AC matches relative to the number of rules, you probably have some weak atoms in there somewhere. Um, when you're doing wildcards, jumps, and regexes in particular, this is going to be really useful for you to watch for because also, again, these things can blow out the number of atoms you have. And the other one is this is very useful for helping to bug when a string is not hitting for a given rule because I didn't show it, but it'll also output kind of what rules hit what files and what patterns even hit what files. So kind of finally, one last uh, example for patterns is limiting by file type. Um, the example is Shockwave Flash, um, and you can see it's from uh, Inquest's uh, blog. And it's essentially, you can do a regex. That's very bad. Um, especially since you're only looking for three strings. You can do it with strings, and that's going to be okay, but those are a little bit short. 
and can add some overhead. Or you can wait and do it in the condition at the end. So this is only going to actually run at the very end. It's looking at the beginning of the file. That's going to be at least in RAM, if not in cache, every time you go to look at it in the condition. So it's going to be even faster. That's the best way to do it. Um, this brings me now to kind of a couple things you can do with conditions real quick because um, they can be faster. And as mentioned, short-circuiting means if you've got false and do something, you won't do that thing. If you've got true or do something, you likewise won't do that thing. So if you've got expensive operations you want to do, um, having a condition in front to block it is really effective. Um, and you avoid it unless you really need to do it. Um, now let's look at static file hashes in particular are really expensive, but a lot of kind of IOCs are just file hashes. So what are you going to do? Or even if you want to use full file hashes and you do have a sample and want to speed it up, what can you do? Well, what if we do what AV engines do when we start doing the first thousand bytes after the uh, entry point first? So what we can do is instead of looking at the full file hash first, we just say, let's go look at the entry point, only hash a thousand bytes. And then in turn, if we need to go back and hash the whole file, we can go do that as well. And this will kind of let us go do a bunch of static file matches really quickly without reading nearly as much data. Um, so generally conditions are a better place to do kind of lookups if you have, um, if you have static locations in the files and uh, fixed byte patterns. Other than that, the main thing is keep an idea on how many atoms rules are creating and try and limit it as much as you can. It's not always going to be possible. Um, watch for atoms and patterns that hit a large proportion of files because, again, that's going to mean it's going to be doing that much more work. Use regex and, and the magic library sparringly, especially because magic doesn't work on Win32 and is slower than almost anything else you can do. I don't know why. And um, finally, when you're doing your conditions, order kind of from the least to most expensive and use operators that'll short circuit to minimize the amount of work you do. All right, and I uh, might have time for maybe a yeah, question. Yes, thank you, Jeff. I think we do have one question here. So the question is, which is better performance-wise uh, when, when using a regex string, uh, is it better to use no case or to write a regex pattern which implies no case? So to, I guess, reduce the character set or, or have a, a, um, a pattern. It's basically, use no case as the operator or use uh, a, a, you know, a character set in the regex. Um, you're absolutely going to be better off uh, using no case than regex. Um, regex is essentially going to have to go build and execute a state machine that's going to be doing the same kind of comparison, whereas no case is kind of going to have a, a simpler kind of just it's going to look between between the two. Um, so it's um, in general regex has, takes a little bit more to set up and it has a bit more overhead to run compared to something like no case. Um, it's not always intuitive why that should be, but that's kind of, it's just the side effect of kind of the overhead of regex. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, Joe.